All right, I think we're good to go now. Let's, uh, I'm glad you're here to join us again today for another Bible study. I hope that these lessons are a blessing to you. I know that these things are can be somewhat uh, controversial a little bit with uh, some of these lessons, but the whole purpose of these things, number one, is to teach you the truth, and I believe these this uh, template explains things in a way that, and rightly divides the word of truth in a way that's important for you to understand as a Christian. But if nothing else, I hope that these lessons uh, benefit you in the sense that it helps you to think. It, it puts uh, some ideas, some thoughts, a different perspective in your mind uh, to be able to consider some things that maybe you hadn't considered before. And so I hope that these lessons help you to think. But uh, this is lesson number seven in this series on the vertical, horizontal, and inverted. And the purpose, like I said, of these lessons is to help you rightly divide the application of God's Word in these various matters and not get things all jumbled up, specifically jumbling up the things that pertain to the horizontal and the vertical. Because when you get the vertical confused with the horizontal and vice versa, you, you start getting into wrong thinking, wrong beliefs, wrong doctrine, wrong behavior. Uh, but when you separate the vertical from the horizontal and you acknowledge these two separate things, a lot of things in your that pertain to your life as a Christian actually start to make a lot more sense. And you're able to place things a lot better and not get too off balanced one way or the other. Uh, last week I did a lesson on how this template pertains to the government and the Christian's responsibility towards it. And if you didn't get a chance to watch that lesson, I highly recommend that you do uh, because there's a lot of erroneous thinking and teaching that's going around in Christian circles these days in regards to that subject. And if you misunderstand Romans 13 and if you jumble the vertical responsibility and authority of government with the horizontal responsibility and authority of government, you could end up getting hurt uh, very badly. And by jumbling up the vertical and the horizontal as it pertains to government and Romans 13, if you jumble those things up, you might get the impression that you have to do everything the government says, uh, including injecting yourself with poison, and if you don't, you're sinning against God. Now, I'd have to say sorry about that. You know, that's not true. Here's what's happening. In an effort to be solely devoted to the vertical, you are turning the horizontal ordinances of government into vertical moral laws, thus eliminating the horizontal ordinances, and thereby you have become inverted in your thinking. And I explained all of that last week. And like I said, if you didn't see that, go back and watch that, because that lesson is extremely important for what's going on in this country, in this world, at this time, and in relation to what some preachers are putting out across the pulpits. And common sense, okay, common sense tells you that if, uh, tells you that if someone tells you to inject yourself with something that is untested, something that modifies your RNA, and something that has zero efficacy against the disease that it's supposedly supposed to fight, you don't do it, okay? <laughs> uh, but because so many Christians misunderstand Romans 13, they end up thinking that the mandates of government are the indirect mandates of God, and so they end up getting this, uh, they, they end up doing insane things that defy common sense, uh, but they think that they're doing the right thing. They think that they're obeying the Bible by doing that. But the fact of the matter is that is inverted thinking, because you're making the horizontal ordinances equal with the vertical moral commandments of God. So you don't want to do that. And uh, that template, so like I said, that template is very important in the days that we're living in, and understanding this template could save your life. And now that uh, these things are being mandated for children, it could save your children's lives and uh, even your potential grandchildren, you know, their, their existence. And so anyway, and, I, and these things could actually help you prevent, prevent you from being murdered by your government. And never forget that the greatest killer in the 20th century was government. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, I also did a lesson on citizenship, and then I did a lesson on government, and I'm going to do a lesson on human rights as it pertains to this template, but because uh, that will need to be a fairly in-depth subject, and there's a lot of there's a lot of crazy, in Christian circles, there's a lot of weird thinking when it comes to the subject of human rights, and so there's going to have to be a little bit more of an in-depth study on it, so I've decided I'm going to save that for next week. But today I'm going to tie up a few loose ends as it pertains to this uh, template and the subject of the human being, okay? So today is a subject on the human being, 
Next week is a subject on human rights, <coughs> and then I think I'll be done with this series. All right, as I mentioned before, the vertical pertains to God, it pertains to Jesus, it pertains to perfection, it pertains to heaven, it pertains to the scriptures. Uh, the horizontal pertains to man, it pertains to earth, it pertains to imperfection, and uh, the inverted pertains to the devil, and it pertains to hell, and it pertains to wickedness, okay? Now, bear in mind, when it comes to these things that matter, does not precede spirit. Spirit precedes matter. The Bible does not say, in the beginning, the heaven and the earth created God. No, the Bible says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, a spirit, created the heaven and the earth, matter. Okay? So, God is a spirit, according to John 4-24, and the heaven and the earth are matter, they're material, they're physical, and uh, our spiritual God preceded the physical universe, the material universe. Now, I know you know that, but when we talk about the human being, even though you and I <clears throat> on our daily lives are fami more familiar with the flesh and the physical and the material, the things that we can see and touch, uh, we need to keep in mind that what we see and what we feel and what we interact with is really simply the, the fleshly shell of the true human being. This body is not me. This body is just the vehicle that carries me around <laughs> for all practical purposes. The real person, the real me, the real you, is on the inside of the body. And you don't want to forget that. A human being, okay, a human being is composed of a body, a, I'm going to say a human spirit, okay, and a soul. Now you don't want to confuse the human spirit with the breath of life spirit. Those are two different things. Uh, there's some similarities, but uh, they're two separate things. The human spirit, the body, the human spirit, and the soul is what makes up a person. All right. And any living creature <coughs> that doesn't have all of those three things is not human. Even if it was to have two arms, two legs, a head, eyes, a mouth, and even if it looked like a human, if it was missing the soul, it would not be human. It would be under the category of a beast. A body, a human spirit, no soul, that's a beast. Or, as the Bible calls them, giants, possibly in the Old Testament, uh, that soul is what makes you human. Animals have a body, and animals have a spirit, the spirit of an animal, you know, something like that. But they don't have a soul, okay? Uh, the thing that makes a human being special as a created entity in the universe is that it's uh, the human being is a trinity, three parts, just like God, body, soul, spirit. And uh, that's how we're made in God's image. Uh, in, at least uh, when God created man, he created man in his image, body, soul, and spirit. All right, now these three things are clearly laid out in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. The Bible says, "...and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit okay, and soul and body be preserved blameless." unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know if you're a Bible believer, you're familiar with a lot of this. Uh, if you go to a, maybe a fundamentalist church that doesn't really get into doctrine, this subject is, is extremely important and will help you to understand a lot of things in your Bible. So I hope that you pay attention. And if you're a Bible believer, I think you'll learn something this morning too, because uh, I'm going to present something that's a little different than probably what you've heard. But uh, now, something you should pay attention to real quick is the fact that two-thirds of the human being is spiritual, right? And only one-third of the human being is physical, okay? Therefore, it stands to reason, this is just common sense, and you can see this for yourself, it stands to reason that if uh, you are focusing the majority of your time, the majority of your effort, the majority of your strength, and your energy on the physical, to the neglect of the spiritual, you're off balance. Because two-thirds of you is spiritual. Only one-third of you is physical, and yet most of the world spends most of their time emphasizing and focused on the physical, not the spiritual. And even most Christians are the same way. They focus most of their time on the physical, the material, the temporal, to the, uh, at the expense of the spiritual. And if that's your case, you're off balance. And uh, the main thing that I'm getting at, at, at is this. The thing I want to point out is this. Is your body physical or spiritual? Obviously, your body is physical. 
All right. Is your human spirit physical or spiritual? Spiritual. Is your soul physical or spiritual? It's spiritual. It's not soulish. There's not a third category in the Bible called soulish. No. There's physical and spiritual. And the thing that you need to remember and the thing that will help you in this study and understanding some things is that your human spirit and your soul are both in the spiritual category. They're not three separate categories. They're three separate things. You don't want to make the human spirit and the soul the same thing. There is a division. The Bible gives us a division between those two. But the soul is spiritual and the human spirit is spiritual. And that's a good thing to remember. And uh, I'll explain a little bit of that as you go. And you say, okay, well, no, duh, you know, what does that matter? Well, it matters when you get into the subject of the new birth and the union of the Holy Spirit at salvation. And the question that comes up is, is the soul born again at salvation, or is the human spirit born again at salvation? I don't know if you've ever even asked that question, <laughs> but it's one of those interesting things. And there is some relevance to the difference in those two thoughts and those two beliefs. Is it the soul that gets born again or is it the human spirit that gets born again? Uh, most commentaries and most teaching is that the human spirit is born again at salvation and the Holy Spirit is joined to the human spirit at salvation. And there are a couple of verses that at face value seem to point in that direction, such as John 3, 6 and 1 Corinthians 5, 17. But the more that you study that out, and the more that you remember that the soul is classified as spirit also, uh, the more you take the position that the human spirit is what's born again at salvation, the more problems you run into. And I've done some in-depth studies on that in the past, so I'm not going to belabor all that right now. But uh, just I'm just planning on hitting some basics for today. But the problems, real quick, with the idea that the human spirit is what's born again at salvation is, number one, this would mean that your human spirit is cleansed, okay? So if we're going to say that this is the Holy Spirit and you're born again, uh, your human spirit is born again at salvation. The problem is your human spirit is cleansed and sealed at salvation, not your soul, okay? If that's true, if your human spirit is born again at salvation, that means the human spirit is cleansed and sealed, but your soul is not, all right? Now, instantly in your mind, you might be thinking, well, that sounds problematic, <laughs> okay? If your soul still has sin on it, all right? Number two, the problem is, is that your soul would then still be a problematic part of you and would still be subject to sin and corruption, okay? Uh, and the problem with that is, is that nothing in the New Testament supports that idea. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. In the New Testament, by all indications, your spirit, or I mean your soul, I'm sorry, your soul is what is born again at salvation. And if you would turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, and look at what it says here in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 9. Okay. It says, receiving, he's writing to Christians, and he says, receiving the end of your faith, that's justification, you receive it at the moment you trust Christ as your Savior. Back in the Old Testament, if there's any justification, you'd receive it after you die, you know, after you've been dead, and then, you know, determine whether you go to heaven or hell. But you, as a born-again Christian, receive the end of your faith, that justification, the moment you get saved. He says, receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your what? Souls. Souls. All right? Then he says in verse 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls. Okay? How? In obeying the truth. That's going to be the truth of the gospel. Through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So you have in that context the purification of the soul, the salvation of the soul, and being born again. All right? So the soul, I believe, is what's born again at salvation, not the human spirit. And after you're saved, there's a part of you that is sinless, it is sealed, and it cannot sin anymore, and it is cut away from the body or circumcised from the body of flesh, as the Bible says in, second, or in uh, Colossians 2.11. Now, this, this uh, doctrine 
provides an explanation, as we know from first, for First John 3, verse 9, that says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. All right, Christians, as you and I both know, can most certainly sin and do things that are wrong and sinful. Uh, but Paul explains in Romans chapter 7 that when we sin, sin is what's uh, quarantined in the flesh. And so when we sin, it's not our new nature that sins, it's our old nature that sins. And uh, sin is quarantined in the flesh, and sin doesn't contaminate the soul anymore. All right? Now, I personally believe and maintain and teach that it is the soul that is the embodiment of one's identity. Uh, it's the soul that is the primary eternal element in a man, and it's the soul that goes to heaven or goes to hell when you die. All right? And I also believe that it's the soul that makes a human separate from an animal. Animals don't have souls. You don't read about that in the Bible. It is the soul, like I said, that will exist forever in heaven or hell. And it is the soul that is made alive at birth, and, and as Paul says, was uh, without the law once. Right? Uh, in Romans chapter 7, he talks about that, verse 9. <clears throat> so, basically, when you're born, you're born with a sin nature. We know that. <clears throat> when a child is born, uh, the reason why children die is because there's sin in the flesh, obviously. The sin is part of the flesh, you know, is passed down from Adam. There's sin in the human being. But the reason why, but the Bible says when, when Adam breathed the breath of life, he became a living soul. And so when a child is born, he becomes a living soul, okay? And he's a living soul. He's not a dead soul. He's a living soul. There's a, he, he is alive without the law, as, as Paul would say in Romans chapter 7. So when a baby is born, there's sin in the flesh, most certainly. Uh, it doesn't, he's not born with a sinless body, obviously. Sin is in the flesh, and the body is corruptible. But the soul is a living soul, okay? It, it's not born again, but it is a living soul. But Paul says in Romans chapter 7 that uh, there was a time, and we, we call this the age of accountability. It's not a Bible term per se, but it's a good term to describe what we're talking about. When a child reaches an age where he understands the law of God and his responsibility to God, understands the commandment of God, and then sins against God willfully, knowingly what he's doing, just like Adam and Eve did. Uh, the Bible says, sin revived, and I, the real, the real me, the soul, sin revived, and I died. Okay, At that moment, when a child sins for the first time, sin corrupts the soul. And now the soul is dead in trespasses and sins. Whereas, if a child was born, and let's say it died at you know, one year old, uh, you know, 15 months died. It's a very sad thing. But the reason why that child's soul would not go to hell is because that soul had not been corrupted by sin. It was alive without the law once. And there was no sin in the soul. That soul would go to heaven. Okay? If that child died before the age of accountability. But when sin revives in the child, Paul says, I died. So that's the typical condition of an unsaved man. Sin in the body, sin in the soul. And the free will of the human spirit, as I'll get into, can make a choice between sin and sin. <laughs> you don't have any other choice. But when you get saved, your soul is purified, your soul is saved, and you're born again. Your soul is born again because it was your soul that was alive once and died and now is born again. You see? It actually makes a lot of sense when you <laughs> put it that way. All right, so the soul at salvation is born again when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's your soul that's purified. It is your soul that's sealed. And it is the soul that is joined to the Holy Spirit and made one with Christ, as, you, as we know throughout the Bible. Um, and if that's true, if, if that presentation is true, then it would explain why in the New Testament the soul is never a subject of concern after salvation. When a Christian gets saved, the soul is never a subject of concern. In the New Testament, there is very little that is said about the Christian's soul and zero admonition for me to be mindful that I maintain the purity of my soul. And the reason why I don't have to be careful to ma maintain the purity of my soul is because it's already been purified by the blood of Jesus Christ and nothing can change that. 
Okay, so regardless of what I do or don't do, whether I serve the Lord or don't serve the Lord or, or go headlong into sin, I don't need to be mindful of keeping my soul pure because that's already sealed. That's already taken care of. And the New Testament doesn't have anything to say about me keeping my soul pure. However, I am admonished to pay attention to and be mindful of my spirit. Okay, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. The Bible says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us, writing to Christians, who are born again, okay, there's an aspect of these people that is sinless, but look at what he says. He says, Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and soul. No, that's not what he says. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. All right, James 4, 5 says, Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us, writing to Christians, lusteth to envy? All right, so he's writing to Christians. He doesn't say the soul lusts to envy. It doesn't, because the soul doesn't sin anymore after you're saved. But the spirit does. The spirit does. The spirit. There's a problem with the spirit, and I got to take. I have to be mindful of my spirit after I'm saved, which indicates that the Holy Spirit is not joined to my whole, to my human spirit. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a problem. All right. So the human spirit is all is by all indications uh, synonymous with the mind and with the heart, and is the seat of personality and free will. And when I get saved, I still have the same personality that I had before, and I still have a free will after salvation to be able to choose to do right or choose to do wrong, even after I'm saved. Now, my soul is sinless and cannot sin. I don't have to worry about that. But my body is saturated with sin, it's soaked with sin, and it cannot do anything that counts towards vertical righteousness. There's nothing my body can do in, my, in the power of my own flesh. There's nothing that I can do in and of myself that can please God. The part of me that pleases God is the part of me that's joined to Jesus Christ. Okay, But I still have, as a Christian, I have free will to either yield to the Holy Spirit, okay, or... I can yield to sin in the body of flesh. But that choice, that free will, is contained here in the human spirit. I'm going to write free will. That was true before I was saved, and that was true after I'm saved. And uh, my soul is the inward man that Paul speaks of in Romans chapter 7. My body is the flesh that Paul speaks of in Romans chapter 7. And Paul describes the struggle of the will in that chapter. If you'll turn there, Romans chapter 7. Uh, actually, look at Romans chapter 1. I'll turn there real quick. I know you're not... And I, well, if you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 1. Uh, Paul describes in Romans chapter 7 a third entity there that wants to please God. And I believe that's the human spirit. It has a desire to please God. And Paul said, in, even in Romans chapter 1, verse 9, he says, For God is my witness, whom I... That is the soul, whom I, the identity, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. So when you're right with God, when you're walking in the spirit, uh, Paul says, I, the identity, the soul, serve with my spirit, my choice, my free will in the gospel of his son. All right. Then in Romans chapter 7, look at verse 25, Paul says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, that's the human spirit, the mind, the heart. So then with the mind, I myself, the soul, serve the law of God. I myself, with the mind, serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. So when I yield myself to sin in the flesh, as the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, I can't do anything that pleases God. That's, that's a choice that I can make. But when I yield to the Holy Spirit and the soul, I do always those things that please the Father. You see? All right? So, when the human spirit, when the mind, the heart, and the will is aligned with and yielded to the Holy Spirit, uh, the inward man, where my soul is, if you will, you can then do those things that please God. And living a life that is pleasing to God is not by self-effort, it's not by sheer determination. 
but by choosing to yield to the Holy Spirit and walking in the Holy Spirit by faith. I don't get over here by, by, by attempt, my own personal attempts and my works and my determination. That's not how you get over here to where you're walking in the Spirit. You get over here by faith, okay? Faith. It's very important. And it's faith in what Jesus Christ has done for you. And I'll explain that here in a minute. Uh, but this is why an unsaved person can desire to please God. There's a lot of unsaved people that have a desire to please God, and that's a good desire. Uh, and they can even will themselves, themselves to do good things. But the problem with an unsaved man, they might have a will to serve God and a will to please God. And a lot of times that's why people get in religion in the first place because they want to please God. They might choose the wrong religion in their blindness. They might choose Mormonism. They might choose Catholicism or whatever. But they have a desire because they want to please the God that they believe created them. But the problem with an unsaved person is they have a sinful soul and a sinful body. And even if they uh, gravitate towards the spiritual things in life, they still can't please God. Even though they may do good things and do good works and live a clean life and do a lot of good things and be a good person, as far as the horizontal is concerned, they cannot please God as far as the vertical is concerned because it's either sin or sin. That's the only options they have. The reason why you as a Christian can please God is because your soul is joined to the Holy Spirit and when you yield to the Holy Spirit, then you can do those things that please God and God, Jesus Christ can work through you. All right. So when you have this viewpoint, you end up with a perfect match for what we have in our template. So you have the Christian's nature. Okay, so now we're going to deal with the Christian's nature. Vertically, you have the soul and the Holy Spirit. Okay, even though this is purple, don't match the soul with the inverted. That was not intentional. So just ignore the colors there. But uh, the soul, as a, for a Christian, is the vertical part of you. It's the born-again soul joined to the Holy Spirit that can't sin anymore. No sin. Remember, the vertical is perfection. Okay? The horizontal is where your human spirit is. Okay? The human spirit is horizontal. The inverted is the body with sin. Okay? The old man, the flesh. The soul is one with Christ and uh, one with the Holy Spirit and cannot sin and it pleases God. Okay? It's born again, pleases God. The human spirit, if you will, is the man in the middle uh, that can either yield to the Holy Spirit or yield to sin. Okay? And uh, you, like I said, you have sin in the flesh down there. The body is corrupt because of sin and cannot please God. All right. So remember how I've showed you that uh, the inverted is bad. The horizontal, we might say, is better. And the vertical is best. Okay. And the other thing is that the inverted is bad. The horizontal is a mix. And the vertical is good. Okay. The thing about the horizontal is it's not as bad as the inverted, but it's not as good as the vertical. The horizontal is a mix between bad and good. It's, kind of, it's a spectrum, as I've told you before. And uh, you have the same exact thing with the born-again Christian. You have the flesh, which is bad. You have the human spirit, which can yield to good or bad. And then you have the soul, which is good. And uh, you have the uh, body, which is bad. The human spirit, which is better in the sense that it has a desire to do the right thing sometimes, but the soul is best, and that the soul is the key to walking in the spirit and pleasing God. All right? So, uh, your human spirit has the choice and the free will to choose between the good soul that's joined with the Holy Spirit or the bad flesh that's joined with sin. And here's the thing, when you, when, when, uh, you go to heaven, God will solve the problem with the human spirit. Because right now, your human spirit can still make wrong decisions and yield to the sin. But someday, God is going to solve that problem by the rapture or by the resurrection. When the Lord returns, you're going to get a new body. Okay? And it's going to be a sinless body. Okay? And so when you get to heaven with a sinless body, your soul is still one with Christ. Still joined to the Holy Spirit. You're still a trinity. 
when you get to heaven and you get a new body, your new body is not going to have sin, and you're going to be in a position that's the complete opposite of the unsaved man, where you can yield to your body, or you can yield to your soul, if you will, and it doesn't matter because there's no sin anywhere. You couldn't sin if you wanted to, because there's no sin in you. You see? You're completely purified, you're perfected up in heaven. Now, uh, I know that uh, most of you know a lot of these things. You know that the new man is uh, sinless and sealed, and you know that the old man is corrupt and cannot please God. And that's fairly straightforward and commonly understood by Bible believers. But I think that the thing that is often misunderstood and misconfused is this area of the human spirit. All right? So it's not my intention to always just go against the grain, but <laughs> there's, when you start getting into the details of some of this stuff, you got to straighten some of these things out because there's uh, some erroneous thinking that goes on and it ends up, like I said, erroneous thinking results in erroneous beliefs and it results ultimately in erroneous behavior. And uh, when it comes to the human spirit, there's some wrong thinking that tends to go around in Christian circles. And I hope this template will help you to understand that and rightly divide even that, that area of the human spirit a little bit better. Now, so check this out. In simplified terms, your body is your appearance. Okay? Your soul, I guess I should write this down. In very, very simplified terms, your body is your appearance your soul is your identity all right your human spirit is your personality okay now let me explain that a little bit your soul is your eternal existence it's the part of you that exists in heaven or hell forever. That's that's the that's you. That's your your eternal. Uh, it's your identity, and it makes you a sentient human being. Your human spirit is your personality. Uh, your soul is what makes humans distinct from other sentient entities in the universe, such as cherubim or demons or animals. <coughs> your soul is what makes you distinct from those other entities. Your human spirit is what makes you distinct from other humans on the earth. It's your personality. Your soul is what makes you what you are. It makes you a human being. Your human spirit is what makes you who you are. It's your personality. It's your likes. It's your dislikes. It's your demeanor. It's your uh, tendencies. It's your emotions. It's your quirks, if you will. It's your behavior, your demeanor. Uh, it's essentially who you are. It's essentially what makes you, you. It makes you different from everybody else, all other humans, okay? Your body is a combination. Well, actually, let me say this. You got your human spirit while you were in the womb, and that came from your mother and father. And your human spirit is essentially a combination of your parents' human spirits. Your mom had a human spirit, your father had a human spirit, and when you're born, your spirit is kind of a combination of those two spirits, which explains why babies demonstrate personality in the womb. We know that. Because, why? Because they have a human spirit. And it explains why children often have the same demeanor, the same personalities, very similar proclivities, tendencies, and sometimes even similar addictions as their parents. How do you explain that? It's because they have a combination of the spirits of those parents in them. Uh, your body is a combination of your parents' bodies. And so your appearance is a combination of your parents' appearances. And in the same way, your human spirit is a combination of your parents' human spirits. And so your personality is a combination of your parents' personalities. And the thing I want you to understand is the horizontal, the human spirit, is not all bad nor is it all good. The horizontal is always a mix, okay? You never want to try and make the horizontal all bad, and you never want to try to make the horizontal all good to where you only have two categories instead of three. Because if in your thinking you try to make the, Holy, the, the human spirit all bad, or in your thinking you make the, whole, the human spirit all good, and make two categories instead of three, when you do that, you will become off balance and you will eventually become inverted. And here's how this applies to what we're talking about. Your human spirit is not totally depraved. 
Okay? Your human spirit is not totally depraved. Even prior to salvation, when you had a sinful body and a sinful soul, you still had a human spirit that could choose to do good, and oftentimes did do good. And we've covered that in previous lessons. It's just that the good that you did was horizontal good. It was not vertical good. An unsaved man cannot do vertical good. He can only do horizontal good. All right? And uh, nevertheless, you still had a free will to choose. And when the gospel was presented to you, you chose to believe on Christ. All right? Your human spirit is what made that decision. Your human spirit is what chose Jesus Christ. And that was a good choice. That was a right choice. And you made that choice while you had a sinful body and a sinful soul. All right. So the point is, if you were totally depraved, as, as the Calvinists teach, you couldn't have made a good choice to believe on Christ. All right. So what I'm getting at is total depravity, number one, is not true. Okay. But what I'm getting at is your human spirit was not totally depraved before salvation, and your human spirit is not totally depraved after salvation. You say, well, who believes that? Well... I wouldn't say that uh, Christians necessarily would teach that, but the way they present some things almost gives you the impression that your human spirit is totally depraved after salvation. Your human spirit is your personality. Your human spirit is who you are. And you are not totally depraved. Now, here's where this gets into with some King James Bible-believing preaching and teaching that tries to pretend that your human spirit is total garbage, it's all bad, and the Holy Spirit is good, but your human spirit is bad, and so they eliminate the horizontal, okay? And they create these two categories where it's good and all good, all bad, okay? And here's where you end up having some problems. There's a lot of preaching that is often amen and it's hailed as, that's good preaching. When really, all it is is a bunch of harping on how worthless you are. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you heard sermons about that? Just talking about how utterly worthless you are? Well, why not just use the word totally depraved? I mean, that's kind of what is coming across. <laughs> how totally worthless you are. And over time, it's almost become a contest that whatever preacher can make you into the lowest pile of dog poop is the winner of the best preacher award. That was good preaching. Rip my face off, preacher. <laughs> you know, that stuff, right? When did that become good preaching? That's not even good doctrine. Asceticism is a word that means severe self-discipline, whether it's mental, emotional, or physical. Asceticism means severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence, typically for religious reasons. Look up that word asceticism, and uh, it'll describe a lot, sometimes a lot of preaching that goes around in Bible-believing circles. It's spiritual asceticism. We wouldn't be like those crazy people in the Philippines that actually whip themselves and crawl on glass and go upstairs on their knees until they're bleeding to get to the top of this uh, church cathedral. You know, we would never do that. But there's an emotional and a mental self-abuse that happens that's perceived as, well, that's being spiritual in these circles. And that's not true. I can't help but wonder if this religious asceticism that goes around in some Christian circles is simply because of an overreaction to the extreme self-love that's in other Christian circles. Oftentimes the charismatic contemporary circles. There's a lot of self-love, self-love going on. So I wonder if Bible believers have, have swung the pendulum too far on the other side to where they're just as off balance. Obviously, the, the world is big on self-esteem and self-worth and self-love and self -love and all that stuff. And they have to continually tell themselves how great they are because they have little to no true external love in their lives coming from others. Uh, because everyone loves themselves. So even the love that others bestow upon others is often motivated by self and what they can get from it. Now, <clears throat> Christians don't need to indulge in all that psychological self-love, self-affirmation stuff like the world does. Why? Because we are truly loved by God with a love that can't even be described. I don't need to try to prop myself up. I already have the love from God Almighty upon me. 
<laughs> Amen. The love that God the Father had for Jesus, the Bible says, is the same love that God has for you if you're saved. Read John 17, 26 sometime. How, I mean, who can even describe the love of God the Father for the love of Jesus Christ His Son? I mean, you couldn't even describe that. But the Bible says that's the same love that God has for you if you're saved. You can't describe it. <laughs> so I don't need all that self-affirmation stuff. I've already got affirmation. I'm accepted in the Beloved. I'm accepted in Jesus Christ. And so are you if you're saved. I don't need to, by myself, convince myself that I am special. I'm already special because God loves me. <laughs> that is awesome. I just simply have to, by faith, believe in what the Bible says. And, but, there, but here's the thing. There's this weird asceticism that goes around that passes off as spirituality these days in some Christian circles. And the idea is this. The more you debase yourself, the more you express how pathetic you are, whether it's over the pulpit or just in conversation with other Christians, and the more you convince yourself of your utter worthlessness, the more spiritual you are. Do you know what I'm talking about? Why don't you be honest with yourself? You know exactly what I'm talking about. You've heard that preaching before. Why not just call it total depravity? <laughs> That's basically what's being communicated. You're, you may be born again, but you're a worthless, good-for-nothing piece of garbage, and you're totally depraved. I mean, why not just put it that way? That's essentially what's being communicated. The question is, is that Bible? Is that biblical? I'm contending that it's not. Okay. Now... <clears throat> the thought is this, the thought is, well, this is how you crucify your flesh. By denying yourself of everything you enjoy. By discarding any happy, positive thought about yourself. And by destroying every trace of self. And then I will be crucified with Christ, is the idea. And this is mistaken by some as the deeper Christian life. All right? Now, I'm not talking about guys who really actually had it nailed down, like Hudson Taylor and Oswald Chambers, some of those guys. They, they knew what the deeper Christian life was. If you read their writings, you, you understand doctrinally what they're describing. But it's not this self-asceticism stuff. As a matter of fact, Hudson Taylor tried that, and he became extremely frustrated until he really realized what the Bible says as, as to how to experience the deeper Christian life, how to walk in the Spirit. He was trying to do it through his own good works and through his own self-effort. And he realized... It's by faith, just like salvation, it's by faith in what Christ has already done for you. And I'll explain that in just a second. You see, this idea of crucifying yourself by discarding you know, uh, any happy, positive thoughts, or denying yourself of anything you like, or destroying every trace of yourself, uh, that's not the deeper Christian life. Because here's the thing, your self, okay, self... That is your human spirit. And when you try to destroy self, all manner of self in you, and you try to cast that out and destroy it, what you're doing is you're destroying your human spirit. And God never told you to do that. God never told you to destroy your human spirit. Okay, And so here's what's happening. In an attempt to be devoted to the vertical... You are trying the vertical Holy Spirit, the soul, the new, the new man, in an attempt to be fully devoted to the new man, uh, you are trying to eliminate the horizontal, the human spirit, and when you eliminate the human spirit, and you try to de debase it and destroy it and cast it out, essentially, and deny every aspect of, of self, if you will, of who you are, even to the extent of suppressing your own personality, okay, you're getting rid of the horizontal, <clears throat> and you are inadvertently becoming inverted. Like I've described in every single lesson up to this point. When in an attempt to be solely devoted to the vertical, you eliminate the horizontal, you inadvertently become inverted. And your thinking is wrong. <clears throat> because here's the thing. When John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease, right? Right? He wasn't advocating the abolition of, the pers of his own personality so that Jesus could shine through. <laughs> okay, Jesus doesn't need your personality stamped out in order for his Holy Spirit to work through you. This is not the problem. 
you don't need to kill this in order for the Holy Spirit to work through you. You don't need to discard or, or stamp out or suppress your own personality in order for the Holy Spirit to work through you. This is not the problem. This is the problem. The body of flesh. All right? To the contrary, we, we see... So like I was saying, Jesus doesn't need your personality stamped out for the Holy Spirit to work through you. To the contrary, as we see all throughout Scripture, God works with and through individuals with their various personalities still intact. Okay, that's important. Demons have to suppress individual personality in order to use their host. God's Spirit doesn't have to do that, nor is there any indication in the Bible that God wants to do that. The thing is, the thing is this, humility, true humility, true Bible humility, is not believing lies about yourself. Well, I'm just completely worthless, I'm just a no-good piece of junk, and blah, blah, blah. You're believing lies about yourself. Where do you find that in the Bible? Now, before you're saved, if from a vertical standpoint, there's none good, no, not one, we've gone over that. But after you're saved, are you not a saint in Christ? Are you not a new creature? Are you not loved by God with a love that can't even be described? So where do you get this stuff? Who's telling you to believe that? Maybe it's an unclean spirit putting those thoughts in your mind, telling you that you're totally worthless and you're totally depraved. How could God love you, even though you're a child of God? You're not believing what the Bible says. All right? You are not worthless. Your soul is worth more than the entire world as far as God is concerned. Mark 8, 36. And as far as your spirit and your personality is concerned, that is what makes you, you, and God loves you if you're saved. If you have multiple children, you love all of them, right? They don't all have the same personality, nor do you require that they suppress out and stamp out their personality, unless you're one of those militaristic parents that don't allow your kids to have any kind of personality. In the military, everybody has to be the same. You have to look the same, dress the same, act the same, obey the same. But that's not the family, okay? That's not what's trying to be done here, all right? In a family, all your kids have different personalities, and that's good. And they all have different quirks, and they all have different senses of humor, and they all have different demeanors. And you don't love the bad things about your kids, obviously. You don't love the bad attitudes, and neither does God, because sinful things are sin and bad, you know. But other than that, you love your kids with all their differences and with all their diversities, and God loves His kids with all their differences and with all their diversities. We are all one in Christ as far as our soul goes. That, my soul, the condition of my soul is the same as any other Christian's soul. We're joined to the Holy Spirit. But, it, but this is very different from Christian to Christian. I have a very different personality than a lot of other Christians. I have a very different personality that, than you, and vice versa. And that's okay. It's okay. We don't have to be all the same exact cloned robots. All right? That's not biblical. So, consider this. When the Lord returns and you get your new body, your human spirit stays intact. You are going to be the same you forever in heaven as you are now, except without sin. You will always be you, because you are your human spirit. Okay? And God doesn't throw your human spirit, your personality, into the wood chipper when you get to heaven. <laughs> okay? Otherwise, that would be the end of you, the, the person that is you. Heaven is not going to be full of a bunch of cloned automatons with the same appearances and personalities. I know sometimes that gets taught where we're all just going to be a bunch of clones, cloned replicas, I guess, of Jesus up in heaven walking around, and that's, that's how it's presented. You know, we don't have personality anymore. We don't have likes. We don't have dislikes. We don't have, we don't have any kind of individualness to ourselves. We're all just cloned robots. Hallelujah. Doesn't it make you want to go, brother? No. That, you don't even see that in creation. God is a God of diversity. A true diversity is in the scriptures, is in God. Look at the diversity. And he, said, he created the entire world in six days, and on the seventh day he saw that it was good. He saw that everything that he had made, even with all its diversity, was good. It was good. He wanted it that way. He wants diversity. Your human spirit, when you get to heaven and, and your body is sinless, you're still going to have your personality. You are going to be you. 
just without all the bad stuff. Amen. All right. And that'll, that'll make heaven a lot more enjoyable. You know, being around a bunch of cloned automatons doesn't sound a lot of fun. <laughs> Not that heaven's supposed to be fun, but you know what I'm saying, okay? Uh, anyway, I, I won't go too far off on that. I know this is a little bit of a... Well, the other thing is, uh, you are going to be you forever, and if you weren't you forever, if your human spirit got stamped out and you had no more personality, uh, technically the term everlasting life would be meaningless, because you would be gone. And I know it's a little bit of a brain twister, but just think about it for a while. So anyway, the point I want to drive home is, and I'm almost done, God loves you if you're saved, okay? It's not your sinfully contaminated body that God loves. No, it's not that. Uh, your soul is valuable to God. And you can make an argument that God loves your soul, if you will. But, but, your, but who you are, the, the you that everybody knows, and it, your personality, that's your human spirit. And God loves you, okay? God is going to clothe your personality, your human spirit, with a sinless body someday so that you can be you without sin whatsoever. And it's not like God is going to love you someday. No, God loves you right now. God loves you. Not just the valuable part of you that is your soul that's worth more than the world. God, God loves your personality. God loves you for you if you're born again. God loves who you are. He loves you for you. Not the sinful aspects of you and the sinful aspects of personality when you're yielded to the flesh and you have bad attitudes and you're unthankful and you're covetous and you have all that bad thought. You know, He doesn't love bad actions, bad thoughts, bad attitudes. That's all because of sin. But once sin's out of the picture, you're not going to have to worry about those things anymore. You'll always have the right attitudes, the right thankfulness, the right... Uh, uh, mentalities and demeanors okay so here's the thing i want want to just point out and then i'll cl uh, close <clears throat> you as a christian should hate the sin in you but don't hate yourself your human spirit you might despise the body that you have but don't despise yourself don't despise your personality don't despise who you are that you are who you are god made you all right and don't try to efface, as uh, the old song says, or destroy your own personality in an attempt to be spiritual. <laughs> because, listen, this is very important to understand. And I know this is going to fly in the face of a lot of preaching you've heard, and I'm okay with that. Because what I'm about to tell you is doctrinally correct, and you need to understand, you need to understand this. You do not need to crucify your members. You say, what? The Bible says we're supposed to. No, it doesn't. You're misreading it. You're changing words like the new Bible versions do. You don't need to crucify your members. You need to mortify your members. Crucify and mortify are two completely different things, and you need to understand that, and you should study that out. You do not need to crucify your members, your body, your flesh. You need to mortify it. And the difference is... Uh, Mortify is to reckon something to be so. Crucify is to kill it. The New Bibles change that to uh, kill your members. You don't, you don't need to do that. You do not need to crucify yourself. Why? Because you are already crucified with Christ. You see? It's something that's already been done. Not something you need to do as a Christian. You don't need to crucify yourself physically, obviously. You don't need to crucify yourself mentally, and you don't need to crucify yourself emotionally. <clears throat> you don't need to do anything to be spiritual, to walk in the Spirit, as far as your works are concerned. All you need to do is simply believe by faith in what has already been done. The deeper Christian life, walking in the Spirit, is the exact same pattern as salvation is. It's not by works. It's not by what you do or don't do. It's by faith in what's already been done. You are already crucified with Christ. You just need to reckon that to be so. You just need to accept that as a fact by faith. 
you are already crucified by Christ. You don't get victory over sinful self. Okay? Sinful self. You don't get victory over sinful self by cutting off everything you like, eliminating everything you enjoy, and destroying everything that brings you pleasure or happiness from your life. That is you trying to crucify you. That's not how it works. Self-crucifixion is impossible, and we know that because God gave us this illustration with crucifixion. You can't crucify yourself because one hand will always be holding the hammer. You can't crucify that other hand. It's a wonderful picture. You can't crucify self. You get victory over sin <coughs> sinful self through faith. Faith in the fact that you are already crucified with Christ, and faith in the fact that you are already raised to walk in newness of life. You have to believe it by faith, and that's how you get victory over the flesh. And that faith is the secret to walking in the Holy Spirit. And when you're in that state, when you're walking in the Spirit, your personality is not suppressed like some kind of MK Ultra personality dis disassociation. <laughs> All right? It's not like that. No, your personality remains intact and is in harmony with the Holy Spirit. Your human spirit and Jesus' Holy Spirit working together fully intact. That's walking in the, in the, in the Spirit. All right? You don't lose your personality when you're walking in the Spirit and become a totally different person. It's the Holy Spirit and your spirit working in harmony. That's how God wants it. So again, the Christian's nature, you have the inverted, which is flesh and the sin, and that's bad. And then you have the horizontal, which is the human spirit, which is a mix of good choices and bad choices, yielding to the flesh and yielding to the spirit. And uh, you might say that it's better, it's better than the flesh, but the vertical is the soul joined to the Holy Spirit, which is good, and it's the best, obviously. Your horizontal human spirit is not bad. It is capable of a mix, okay, of good and bad. It's not all good, and it's not all bad. And don't pretend that it's all good, because it's not. And, but don't pretend that it's all bad either, because it's not. Okay? Acknowledge that sin is in your flesh. Acknowledge that your soul is sealed. And acknowledge that God loves you, your human spirit, who you are. And don't hate what God loves. All right? Don't think that you need to hate yourself in order to be spiritual. Because your personality is not the problem. Sin is the problem. Hate the sin, hate the flesh, hate if you you know the body, whatever the sinful flesh. But don't hate your personality. Don't hate you. Don't hate yourself. Don't hate what God loves. If you're born again, God loves you, and you need to believe that by faith. I hope this lesson was a help. I hope this template helps you understand some of those things. I hope you uh, cease with this uh, self asceticism that's perceived as good preaching and being spiritual, just trying to beat yourself up all the time and talk, telling yourself how worthless you are. Even though that goes on in a lot of Bible-believing circles, that is not biblical. That is this. And that's inverted thinking. And you need to stop that. Leave that there. Reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Because that's the fact, that's the truth, and you just need to believe it by faith. Hope you have a good week, and I uh, hope you come back next week for the last lesson in this series, at least what I think is going to be the last lesson in this series, uh, this, uh, Bible study on what the Bible says about human rights as, as it relates to this template. God bless you. Have a good week.